makes me wonder about these electric cars, you know, because you're, you're basically seated on the top of a giant battery or system of batteries. And uh, I know that s some of these batteries, if you pierce them, they catch fire like crazy. I don't know whether there's been any of these fires with these modern cars or not, but I imagine if they went up, it would go up with a big bang. Well, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for today, Lord, for all that Thou hast given us and all these scriptures which have been preserved. Lord, we are eternally thankful, Lord, for Thy provision. And we pray for the country, Lord, that You would restore it to the Constitution as we see a spiritual move and a, a redemption of people around the country and around the world. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Right, so uh, we're up to part four of our study on law and grace. And you notice I was very particular about the choice of the conjunction here. And, law, and grace. And I'm trying to understand the particular way in which the law is good and right and it, it should be used in a lawful manner. I'm trying to understand that because Paul teaches this. And... Um, just to remind you about that, just go across to 1 Timothy chapter 1 with me while I just remind you of this passage, which I think is extremely significant. And I don't really see too many people making sense out of this. Uh, not good sense, anyway. They certainly uh, will talk about it. Um, uh, this is 1 Timothy and chapter number 1 and verse... Six, from which having swerved, from which some having swerved, have turned aside under vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So there's certainly teachers using the law in Paul's day which were not using the law in the correct way. That's very clear. And I would say that's the same thing going on in our generation as well. That many people are attempting to be teachers of the law and what they're doing is they're destroying the very very important message of the gospel of the grace of God and secondly they're not making known that which manifests the exceeding riches of God's grace one of the things that people have got mistaken with I've come to see this more and more clearly now is that they think that grace can only come from the new covenant and that to, to talk about grace you have to talk about the new covenant but we understand that grace has been around um, before, in fact, the old covenant. And also we see grace coming to us who are not a part of the new covenant. Grace, super, super abounding grace, Ephesians chapter 1. So we don't, we don't need the new covenant to see grace, God's grace. Carrying on, verse 8. But we know that the law is good. We know. Okay. Well, the we there is an interesting one, isn't it? But we know that the law is good. It's not bad. The law is not bad. The law is good. If a man use it, but it's conditioned. If, if a man use it lawfully, lawfully. It's interesting that the two words are clearly linked in the Greek text. Law, nomos, and then lawfully, you can see the nomios, the adverb, the way it's put in place, the way it's used. It's got to be used in a special manner, lawful, lawfully. And it says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, okay? Disobedient, ungodly, and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for per perjured persons, and if there be any other thing. Wait a minute, you've got that big group of people here, uh, and in places we can see we are implicated in some of these things, perhaps. I won't speak for everyone. <laughs> and then it says, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Wait a minute, that's, that's another category. You notice he's using categories here. And this is one of the categories that the law is for. And any other thing that is 
contrary to healthy, sound, healthy doctrine. According. According to what? According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to Peter's trust. No. Sorry, friends. Committed to my trust. Therefore, the law is not something that is outside Paul's gospel. It just has to be used manifestly, lawfully. Mm, now that is something that we do not hear being taught and preached by those who say they believe in the, the Bible rightly divided. I don't hear that. I never heard that. Never. I hear the opposite. Like the law. No, we are not under the law. We're not under the law. And we have nothing to do with the law. You know? But how come? How come this passage here? Where he says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which is committed to my trust. But the law must be used lawfully. We need to understand this. So when I began studying this, I thought, wow, this, 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 this really needs to be opened up. And there, there'll be some worms in here, as I said previously. We've looked at this word Moses and how it's right through the New Testament that there is this tremendous passage for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And we discovered that this is true grace. There was grace, as we will read again in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, there was certainly grace in the law. And that grace typified something, the true grace which would come by Jesus Christ. Yeah, so there's lots in here. Grace for grace. That is, we are seeing grace that was typical and grace that fulfilled that type. The word type comes from the Greek word tupos. Tupos. And this is a great passage where, you know, it talks about this idea of the uh, the grace and the truth in John 1 17. Grace and truth meaning two things for one. Grace and truth meaning true grace. One thing. Hendy Eddis. Okay. And so you see the, this, this picture here. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Moses lifted up the serpent. Okay. That happened. It's a historical thing that happened. But it's a tupos. It is a type. It's picturing the Son of Man who was lifted up on the cross. So you see this. But we don't live in the types. They inform us, however. They point. And once we see Christ and we understand more about Christ, we can go back to these types and we see more of Christ. And Christ informs us and we... It's a feedback loop. You see a feedback loop in all this. There is this map. And the temple was this great picture of heavenly things all throughout the old testament you find there is light but there is also the true light there is glory and then there is the true glory and in ephesians 1 17 it says that god of, that the god of our lord jesus christ the father of glory now look at that expression here just while we're here the god of our lord jesus christ how can jesus christ have a god well, you see, the point about this is that the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh. So what you have here is this functional relationship that happened because the Word took on flesh. And then the flesh can look back at, at God the Father and say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is an interesting thing. And it says here, uh, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Of course, the eyes of your understanding have to be enlightened. Of course, there's greater grace coming. There's greater grace coming to you, which is not part of the new covenant. And we need to read about that. We need to understand it. But the point I'm trying to make is that there is a typical place of the law. It's, it, it pictures something. It pictures Christ. It pictures things to come. It pictures a lot about the fulfillment of prophecy and what God is going to do on the earth. But chiefly Christ and understanding Christ so you can come back into the Old Testament and learn more about Christ and then examine Christ again and then you go back and it's a feedback loop man. And if you destroy the 
Old Testament, which some people try to do. They say, oh, the Old Testament has got nothing for us. It's got nothing for us. What? You are destroying one of the strong witnesses and pictures of Christ. And we can learn a lot about Christ from that. Now, this word here, which is abolished, abolished, is such an interesting word. And what I've done here, I've got this word, ketageo, as it's mentioned in the New Testament. These are all the places. We're not going to go through all these places, but we will look at some of these. This word abolished, it comes up in conjunction with the law. And it's very, very important to understand what's going on. Now, if you look at Luke 13, 7, let's just go back there to get the first one. Okay, let's just look back here. Understanding this is going to open the scriptures. It's important you get this particular word down and understand it. So Luke 13 is a really cool passage. Luke 13 and verse number 6. He spake also this parable, and a certain man had a fig tree planted um, in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. He found none. Okay, so you come, and he's looking for fruit on it, and found none. Disappointing, isn't it? You go to your fig tree, no fruit on it. should be there. It's not there. What a disappointment. Do you like figs? I love figs. Oh, man, it's one of my weaknesses. Dried, fresh off the tree. I don't care what they are. Give me figs. We uh, just recently bought a whole, about five pound, cost me an arm and a leg, of figs from Turkey. I love those things, man. Oh, keep me away. And it says, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years... I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. <laughs> oh, man. No mercy to this tree, man. You bear fruit or you're going to get the, the axe. Cut it down. Now, look at this word. It's an interesting word. We don't use it much. Why cumbereth it the ground? Why cumbereth it the ground? It makes the ground void. That's what it means. It makes it void. It makes it empty. The ground is not doing. It makes the, look like, makes the ground look like it's doing nothing. It's not functioning as it should. But it's actually the tree. So chop it down, man. Why cumbereth it the ground? And then when you come to the next one, okay, that, makes, that means, you know, makes the, the earth void. If you go across to Romans... In chapter 3, this is the next time that this verb is used. Romans 3. And this is where it gets even more interesting. Because that one in the vineyard, it, it's, it's got to do with Israel. We can see that. Romans 3 and verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Mm. So this is during the book of Acts. Much. Every way. Chiefly because under them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God? Now here it comes. Without effect. See that's without effect. This is the idea of making it void. Empty. What? Just because some people don't believe. Does that mean that God is going to be faithless? Is God going to lose his faith and not do the things that he promised to do and then look what it ends up with in verse 4 look at that expression God forbid may it not be so literally may it not be so translated God forbid it uses a special verb and it's put in the optative optative God forbid may it not be so now we come to the verse that we need to look at, which is verse 31. We'll read from verse 28 to get a bit of context. Therefore, we conclude. What do you conclude? 
that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Oh, here it comes. Justified. Declared right before God. Justified. Justifi justification is often used in the context of needlework. Straightening things out. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? It's a good question. But Paul answers it. Yes. Of the Gentiles also. Yes. Seeing it is one God who shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. So this is interesting. By faith, through faith. What's the distinction? Okay, we, we need to solve this. It's not obvious. A lot of people guess at this. At least some of them admit they're guessing. Verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? So, making void the law, yes, but it's making void the law through faith. God forbid. Here that God forbid occurs again, right? May it not be so. Yea, we establish the law. We establish the law. Paul said to Timothy, the law is good if it be used lawfully. Yea, we established the law. We saw last time that the law pictured things. There were types of the coming Jesus. The tabernacle expressed all these things. Have you thought about the tabernacle? And the temple? Wow, there's a, there's a lot in here and Paul uses it and therefore it's right for me to use it. On the one hand, you get this, right? You get a division, a veil between the holiest of all and the holy place. The holy place and the holiest of all. And there is this veil here. In Matthew 27, around about verse 51, it, it talks there about when Christ died, there was this rent in the veil that started from the top. It's very, very careful to say from the top to the bottom. How? How is it going to rent from the top? First of all, this thing is thick. No man is going to be able to easily rip it. And if he did rip it, he's going to rip it from the bottom, right? Didn't rip from the bottom. It ripped from the top to the bottom. Here it is. Making the entrance here into the holiest of all open. Open, you see. That's one, one thing that happened. Okay? But then you also find that around about the temple there was the, the court of the Gentiles, it's called. And there was a division around there, what's called a middle wall of partition. I'll, di I'll diagram it like this. Middle wall of partition. Partition. Okay. Okay. But wait a minute. When was this done away? Well, we don't find this being done away until the revelation of the mystery was revealed to Paul the prisoner. Now, let's see. Let's see what's going on here. There's something going on here, friends. You've got a middle wall, and then you've got this veil here, right? That was rent from top to bottom. Matthew 27, middle wall of, a, of a partition. Ephesians 2. Very Im important places in the scriptures. So if you look at this, you've got this going on. You've got, first of all, during the book of Acts, you find doctrine related to this veil which had been rent from top to bottom where entry is possible for us. And there is Jew and there is Gentile there is the two. The two. But during the book of Acts, the two, while there is salvation opened up for the Gentile, there was also the Jew first, right? It still existed. And so that if you look, for example, in Romans 11, you find in there that there was an unnatural graft. The Gentiles were graft into the olive of Israel. There was a dispensational place for the Gentiles, which meant that 
the both were not totally united dispensationally. Israel was first, even when this thing had been broken down. You see, the middle wall of partition was still up. Still up, even during the book of Acts. Then what happens is we get to the end of the book of Acts, and sometime in here the mystery was revealed. And shortly after that, in AD 70, you have the temple and precincts and all of that being destroyed. And literally, the temple's gone. Over here, this is where you see the breaking down of the middle wall of partition between the two. The two. And that's where this new man was created. Something totally new. Interesting, right? Interesting. That, and you'll notice that doctrine, that whole teaching, still goes back to the law. <laughs> We've got a picture. We've got a picture out of Israel's playbook to understand something about what happened. The Old Testament is now feeding into us, teaching us. Interesting, right? And then it says down here, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. If you look at Romans 4, well, look how it begins. Verse 1. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father as pertained to the flesh hath found. Abraham. You read about this in Genesis. Genesis is part of the Pentateuch. The law. Right? And then it says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteous. Ah, so there it goes. Belief. When he was in uncircumcision. Belief being the foundation for the coming of righteousness. So where he says, God forbid, yea, we establish the law. See, the law is not voided through faith. It's the faith that when you see this, gives you a feedback loop into the Old Testament, and there you can see, oh yeah, it established the veracity of the law. Wait a minute, look at this. Have you ever thought of this? Go back to Jeremiah 31. I just thought of this right now. This is, of course, a very dangerous thing for a preacher to do. Jeremiah 31. <laughs> Jeremiah 31. Look at this. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. So wait a minute. Here we've got back here with the prophets talking about the new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Oh, well, oh I see. So it's with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Do you see the Gentiles in there? Is it with uh, the Gentile peoples? No, not there. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers <clears throat> in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband this is the metaphor husband and wife situation you see that's not our picture is it our picture is the new man the future position male gender an heir the husband not the wife not the bride different okay carrying on although i was an husband under them saith the lord notice the capitals lord jehovah but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law. Wait, 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 wait. Let's just hold the phone here for a second. Let me ask a question. If the law is bad, if the law is bad, why does he talk about the new covenant in this way that he will put his law in their inward parts? Why would you put something that's bad into their inward parts? Well, obviously, it can't be bad, right? Look at this. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. He's going to write it, not in stone, as he did the first time, but this time he's going to take that same law and he's going to put it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. There's an adoption there, friends. Oh man, that's something to, to, to particularly think about when you're thinking about the law. 
Now, when I first under started understanding something about right division, believe me, I got a lot of these mid-act grace preachers, and all they could preach about was grace, meaning that the law was somehow bad. That's somehow bad. And there's a distorted teaching about this. Look at this prophecy I showed you last time. This comes from Isaiah and Micah. Look at this. Isaiah 2, 3. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. What? And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Jerusalem now being very important in God's eyes. And the law. The law. What's going on, friends? Do you notice that those nations in the millennium that are not obedient will not gain rain. And they must come to Jerusalem. They must come there and show their obedience to the law. This, Micah 4.2. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Well, if the law is bad, he's got a strange way of showing it. First of all, he's going to write it in the nation of Israel's hearts. And then he's going to have make sure that the law is going to go out forth from Jerusalem. It's pretty strange. You think the law is so bad. Look at this. This is something that I want to look at right now. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at this. This is 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. This is the New Covenant, Diathike. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, in what way does it kill? Is it a murderer? No, that's not the idea here. What happens is the letter kills in a special way. The letter kills because, my friend, you see, the problem is our flesh. And it gets in the way. You can be given good commandments, but the problem is you break them because of your fallen nature. And it brings forth death in our members. But if the ministration of death, written and graven in stones, oh, so it's very clear, look at this, it's in stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. What's this about, the glory? Do you remember that when Moses came down from the mount, his face shone. So he put a veil on. Now, I'm not sure for the, what reason the, the, the modern-day Jews have this telleth, you know, where they cover their head. They cover their head with a veil. It may have come from this that Moses did. And it says, which glory was to be done away. Oh, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? More glorious, right? For if the ministration of condemnation, boy, look at how this has been expressed. The ministry of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Okay, so here we got that thing that I showed you before, right? The glory and the bigger glory. The glory that was there, a part of the law, it was good. Hold your place there, friends. Just hold your place here because we're going to come back to it. Look at this. Romans chapter number 8. Look at this. I just want to feed this. Paul is big on the law and what it means. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Made him free. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Okay, so the law was weak through the flesh. The flesh, because the flesh is fallen, it could not get to the righteous standard of the law. And what ended up was, you just keep getting condemned. You try and obey the law, but your flesh gets in the way and you're condemned. And then you try and make amends for it. And you keep going around in this cycle of condemnation, right? That's what the law did. But it doesn't mean to say that the law was bad in itself. 
it was weak through the flesh. You get this, what I'm saying? Paul is careful about this. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. I should read verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Oh, see what he's saying? He's not now trying to get out of the law and say that, okay, Christ now has instituted and given us a righteousness which, which in some way doesn't pertain to the righteousness which was in the law. Quite the opposite. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Okay, so now... We have a, a new way of walking, not after the flesh. Because if we try that, we're going to fail. There must be a new way of walking after the Spirit. The Spirit's going to come and help us to walk in this new and living way. And it says this, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Now look at this. I'm going to stop at verse 7 because I want you to see this. Look at this. This is verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it's not subject to the law of God. Wait a minute. <laughs> Why? Let's think about the logic of what's going on here. Because... The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. So the carnal mind is enmity against God. Why? Because it's not subject to the law of God. You see, the standard is the law of God. Neither indeed can we. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay, what the point I'm trying to make is the law was good had a righteousness which is good but we couldn't meet it and that same righteousness now is available for us to live out if we walk spiritually okay that's the teaching there so when we get back to second corinthians in chapter three look what it says here it says this <clears throat> in verse six who also have made us able ministers of the new covenant not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But the ministration of death, written and graven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of the condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. So you've got a comparison between one glory which excels and another glory which just looks so small now. Now that Christ comes, that which was glory now looks like it's nothing. And it says, For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glory. Now you notice how the scriptures say remaineth. Look at this. For if that which is done away was glorious. What, well, what was done away? This is this expression now. Katargeo. The, the abolishment. If that which was abol abolished. Was glorious. Much more. That which remaineth is glorious. In this time. When that which was being done away. During this time. There was something that remained. Which the which the law pointed to, which is the coming of the new covenant. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face. Oh, we have plainness of speech. Now, when he says plainness of speech, he means now that it's unveiled. You can s clearly see it. With Moses, it's... It's only in pictures and types and you can't see the end of what is abolished. You're stuck in this ministration of death where you've got to try and make your way through it. With the coming of Christ, there is something clear here. There's something plain. It's unveiled. 
and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end that of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which, which veil is done away in Christ. Okay, so here, what I'm pointing out to you is that this teaching is very plain, as Paul says, uh, done away, Moses and Israel veiled, Israel turned that the veil will uh, be removed, the glory of God in the face of Moses, done away the new covenant, the spirit that quickeneth, the ministration of the spirit, the ministration of righteousness that which is, remains the veil done away in Christ, we all with open fa unveiled face the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ the new covenant brings forth this unveiling. Clarity comes. And a new and living way opened up. But my friends, it does not say that the law is evil or it's bad or it's unrighteous. No. Quite the opposite. And the pictures in themselves bring us further towards Christ. Now, um, I, I'm speaking too long here, but I wanted to show you a lot of things here about this whole business of the law and the law of commandments contained in ordinances which pertains to my picture over here this business of the veil rent from top to bottom during the book of acts the two the jew and the gentile they had a certain amount of unity yes they did but there was a distinction there was an advantage given to the jew then as time came went by and the revelation the mystery given to paul he then talks about the middle wall of partition broken down so that there was a new body created, something new created, where the two became one. Very different. Very different from what happened in the book of Acts. Well, we will cover a little bit more of this next time. It's cool stuff, friends. Cool stuff. It's a rock and roll. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this message, Lord, for all the the mighty things that are in the scriptures. And we ask that you would guide us. Pray for the country again, Lord, that you would restore to the Constitution. And, Lord, that we'd see more leaders who are mindful of thee come forward. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.